Father, Lord, we want to thank you for allowing us to join one another again tonight. Our women's uh, time of being able to learn more about you, dear Heavenly Father, grow in uh, grace and grow in your love. Lord, help us to open our minds and our ears and our understandings and our hearts, dear Heavenly Father. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins, dear Heavenly Father. Take out everything that's not like you. Give us uh, a mind to want to be in that sweet hour of prayer, dear Heavenly Father. Give us a mind to do our lessons so we can learn from those lessons, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, uh, be with the pastor tonight as he expounds on your word so that we can receive it in our hearts, dear Heavenly Father. And Lord, we just want to thank you. We praise you. We lift you up because you're so worthy. We glorify your name. You're just a worthy God. Thank yeah. you, Lord Jesus, for yes. all that you've done. Just yeah. waking us up this morning, giving us breath, Lord. We're here safe and sound tonight. And for those that are on the way, Lord, bless them to make it here safely, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys can be seated. Um, it is good to be with you guys this new semester. And um, as you can see in your um, outline, if you guys have gotten one, uh, we are dealing with maturity in Christ. The subject will be the Samaritan woman of John 4. Many of you may be somewhat familiar with it, but I trust that over this, this 13 weeks, you will learn more than you ever have known about this particular topic. We will be raising the question tonight and over the course of 13 weeks, who is this woman at the well? And this question will be a premise for our own personal self-examination uh, and reflection in terms of how we relate to her when it comes to how we have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's going to be 13 weeks of answering that question. This, this woman at the well in John chapter 4, um, she's a phenomenal person when you really think through what occurred, what took place uh, between her and this Savior that happens to have met her at a very opportune time. And the, uh, the, the answer that we want to derive from who is this woman at the well really has to do with the life of the believer in Christ over the spectrum of our walk with Christ from the time that we met him to the time that we see him face to face in glory. So this 13 weeks is really gonna be an excursion through what I am calling the life of the believer. It just happens to be, as we're gonna be working through the context of the Gospel of John here, that this woman's short snippet of an insertion into the sacred text, 42 verses in John's Gospel chapter four, will just serve for you and I to really see what it means to know God in his grace and what it means to have had Christ make an impact in our life on such a radical level that, as I said, um, the woman that is meeting Jesus at the well is not the same woman that's going to leave the well and go back to her people. What she is when she comes is not what she's going to be when she goes. Now, now, when you have been impacted by knowledge like that, we call that a transformation formative effect. That's effective data changing your life. And a lot of what goes on uh, for some of us, and then also for many people, is that things don't change. Even when we are disposed to significant information, our lives don't change. And what I want to help us to do over the many weeks that uh, we are uh, given grace to come out and study or to get the lessons is see incrementally what it means to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so we're dealing with what I call a woman. Now for me as a man, uh, some of my sisters who have been with me for many years know that I'm, I'm window shopping. And so you're, you're gonna have to help me as we work through some of the nuances of the female component in the relationship. But I, I've been around long enough 
to know a little bit about women. How many of you guys have been in my women theology class before? Okay, so like 80% of you, right? So would you say that our theology classes have been beneficial to you as women? Not just as sisters, but as women, because we have tailored our messages around the gospel, but particularly in relationship to women, haven't we? And we've seen how the Bible has really exalted the Imago Day in the woman and how she plays a critical role in the advancement of the gospel, have we not? And, uh, and so uh, it's going to be a beautiful thing to see. I have uh, thought about what it means to be a woman, and uh, I have uh, five C's. You know, I love to do these, uh, these acrostics and these alliterations. So the first C I consider when defining a woman is what I would call complicated. Complicated. The second C is what I would call crazy. Crazy. Now, there is a real genius to crazy, so don't take it in a negative way if you have issues with men, okay? Uh, but crazy has a really profound connotation when it comes from a vertical perspective. Please understand that. Crazy for one person is another person's genius, okay? Um, the Bible uh, says that the gospel is called foolishness to those that are without. And so this message of salvation that we preach to the world is crazy to them. But for God, it's his wisdom. And when you understand the role of the female in relationship to the male in that complementarian, uh, uh, interdependent uh, role of advancing the glory of God, the Bible clearly elucidates that women are typified by wisdom. By wisdom. And that's because wisdom is an engendering principle. Wisdom is an engendering principle. In other words, when wisdom is employed in our lives, it bears fruit. It's one thing to have knowledge. It's another thing to have what? Wisdom. Wisdom being the proper application of knowledge so that the outcome of that knowledge applied is a life that glorifies God. The Bible typifies the woman as that, in fact, the gospel says it in Matthew chapter 11, uh, wisdom is justified of her what? Children. And so when I say crazy, please understand that I'm simply saying that there are elements about the female species that is uniquely and uh, particularly isolated and exclusive to them. So I, I got comp, comp, uh, complicated, I've got crazy, I've got committed. When you read your Bible, you find that the women of God are committed to Christ in many ways more committed than the men, more committed than the uh, men. Did I give you four already? I gave you three or four? Three. Okay, so let me give you the fourth one. Calculate it, calculate it. So women are uh, uh, complicated, uh, complex, uh, crazy, calculated, and committed. All right, take those C's and work with them. Um, and as I stated, the woman that's at the well today, and it's only a one-day event that transpires that's going to take us 13 weeks to work through, is not going to be the same woman when she leaves the well. The woman that comes to the well on this day is not the woman that goes back to the village. Now, I've been married almost 38 years, and I've, I've been married to five different women. Um, and they all have the same name, Barbara. Uh, but they're five different women. And I'm told if I live another 20 years, I got two more women that I have to deal with. And I'm looking forward to that because each woman is different. And the one I'm dealing with now is, is really complicated and, uh, and complex, but committed, committed. And so I'm looking forward to the last two. Crazy was the beginning. That was when we were teenagers, she was crazy. And then she became uh, uh, contrived, uh, uh, calculated, and, and wise, and prudent, and dealing with a brother. So I'm still trying to figure her out, and I got two more to go, and I thank God for it. This was the struggle that Jeremiah had with women. Y'all remember that? This is Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Jeremiah was sleeping, and God came to him in a dream and said, Jeremiah, I know you're struggling with women, but is there anything too hard for me? Y'all get that in a second. The word means too difficult, too complex. Have you heard God say that? When we have struggles and issues, he comes to us and says, is there anything too complex for me? Too difficult? 
Is it so complex that I can't figure it out? Are there anything that goes on in our universe that God doesn't have full knowledge about? And so it is also with you as women. He made you marvelously and wonderfully, even though you are very complex. The text gives us a very complex sister too. And as we work through the text, we will look at the complexity of her life and see how Christ masterfully helped her helped her understand herself. We'll be dealing with um, a uh, rules of engagement class on Saturday. A lot of you guys know that our marriage series will be taking place for the next four weeks starting this Saturday. And one of the things that we will be pressing in on is the challenge of all the couples that are going to be there, our single people that are going to be there, um, our post-married people that are going to be there that have struggled with and asked the question, you know, what happened? What happened in my marriage? How come it didn't work out? How come we weren't able to make it work? And one of the things that I've discovered uh, in pastoring and counseling when it comes to couples, whether it's men or women, is this question that we're really going to be working on. Do you really know who you are? So stay with me. It seems like a novel, very simple question, uh, but it's not. If I were to ask you, and this is going to come up Saturday, if I were to ask you to give me a one-page description of who you really are, I bet you would tell me largely what you do. And in telling me what you do, you would let me know that you really don't know at core who you are. You only know existential things about yourself that are a consequence of external events that fundamentally shaped you and moved you into behavior patterns that really don't speak to the core of who we are. How many of you ladies have struggled with over the course of your life asking the question, who am I? Okay, 50%. That's called honesty because when we deal with it on Saturday, you're going to learn that learning who we are in an accurate way is probably the most difficult thing you could ever do. The, the, the psychiatrists and psychologists, sociologists say that whenever they raise the question about who we are to people, they always get a skewed answer. Most people will tell you things about themselves that really do not reflect the essence. And we always paint a better picture of ourselves than we really are. And so imagine, ladies... If you are in a marriage and you are really demanding of your spouse to meet your needs, right? But you aren't able to effectively communicate him to him your needs because you don't really know yourself that well. Do you see how difficult that is for him? And suppose he is also in the same dilemma, that he doesn't know himself that well. So you got two people who are supposed to actually be in the most intimate relationship any human being can have apart from Christ, trying to know each other, but don't. Can you see the challenge with that? Right, and so those are kind of things that we're going to be working through on Saturday, and I submit to you that the woman is about to be exposed in our text for not really knowing who she is. And her God will have to touch her in places to help her see the truth about herself. And I hope that we will also see the truth about ourselves as well. So as we deal with the introduction, here's what I want to say. Uh, this is a sister, as we know, and she lives where? In Samaria, right? Um, are you guys warm or are you cold? Are you just right? Raise your hand if you're just right. All right, so that's 95%, I'm done. Um, uh, she's a sister and she's from where? Samaria. So we're going to call her for the sake of just a common point of reference, Sister Sammy. Can we do that? This is Sister Sammy. This is the way this is going to work over the next 13 weeks. I will be calling her Sister Sammy because I'm very personable and I like to know people on a personal level. So right now we will be dealing with Sister Sammy. And so will you pull up our first point, if you will, our fundamentally our introduction. This is a biblical survey that we're going to be dealing with using her life uh, as a principle of life, growth, and maturity in Christ. Uh, and this is an essential subject to which every believer should devote themselves. Growing in Christ, maturing in Christ, 
Developing a clear understanding of who you are in Christ should be the thing you should be devoting yourself to more than anything. Growing in Christ, maturing in Christ, and developing personally in Christ should be your highest goal. Okay, that should be your goal. Not doing something for Jesus or doing something for anyone else. That is not your highest goal. Your highest goal is knowing God and therefore knowing yourself so that your walk with God can be truly authentic. Hence, if I do not grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord in a right way, I won't know God as I ought to. And he won't know me from the standpoint of who I am as he ought to. Does that make some sense? In other words, we can play games with God when we don't know who we are relative to God. And so the Bible tells us in Psalm 51 verse 6 that God desires truth from the inward part. God does not want a relationship where you and I are superficial. He doesn't want a relationship where you and I would try to hoodwink God or play games with God. Now, anybody in the house has ever done that? Religion is good at it. You don't have to raise your hand, but it's true. Religion is good at existential relationships that don't really get at the real issues. Like you can go weeks and months without really praying sincerely to God. You can go years without a profound pursuit of God's word to know him. You can build an image of God in your own mind that does not correspond with the Bible. And you can own God as your God and tell people, this is my God. And later come to discover you didn't know him much at all because you really didn't understand that the knowing factor is a mutual relationship. That you and I have to learn how to be honest with ourselves and then be honest with this God, which means on many occasions, because God is God and we are not, we don't know God, why God does what he does. We don't understand everything that God does. So think about the vertical relationship between us and God as we would think about the horizontal. Do we struggle in horizontal relationships? Why wouldn't we struggle in the vertical one? Can I get some truth in the house? Raise your hand if you're with me today. Because you see, we can also play the same game with God that we do with the man in the horizontal lane. And what we call this is religion. Where we build a construct of God that doesn't correspond with this word, and we build that conduct construct so that it can meet my need. Problem is, I don't know myself well enough to know that the construct that I've made of God will actually meet my need. So I got two superficial, artificial images that I'm operating out of. Now, this woman is going to help us see that. As the Lord Jesus Christ, who is called in John 14, 6, what? The way, the truth, and the life. This woman is going to help us see how that you can go a long time in religion. You can get wrapped up in so many unsatisfying relationships because you never ever penetrated the truth and core of the reality of true worship and met the true God and thereby meet the true self, which is essential to satisfaction in our relationships. So we are dealing with our introductory point, a biblical survey of life, growth, and maturity in Christ is an essential subject to which every believer should devote themselves. Admittedly, our initial conversion experience of grace and new life in Christ is a major reference point in the life of the Christian. Let me start right there by teaching. When we talk about our initial relationship with God in Christ, we are talking about where we are authentically born again, where we have been born again. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, 23. Don't go there, please. Being born again, not of incorruptible seed, but uh, our corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, even by the word of God. So we all know that if we know the Bible right, that there must be a new birth in our life if we are truly children of God. Is that true? There must be a new birth. And that is the critical starting point in our life. And that, that's a call. It's a regeneration work. It's a work of illumination. You see that in your outline, right? It's a work of illumination that takes place in your life. And then it's also a transformation by the power of the gospel, which the scriptures call an unspeakable gift full of glory. I want you to follow this now, underlined and being transformed. Do you guys see that? Every Christian is called, aren't they? 
We've been called by the gospel. My sheep, what? Hear my voice and they follow me. Every Christian is regenerated. Is that true? That means we're born again. Every Christian also is illuminated, right? God has opened our eyes, our spiritual eyes, to the truth of his gospel. Is that true? And every Christian is in the process of being transformed. That's a present verb form. I am presently being what? Transformed. Presently transformed by the power of the gospel. This is 2 Corinthians 3.18. I want you to see this text. Because I want us to have a foundation today. This is introduction time. This introduction is critical. If I make the assumption that you are believers, and I make the assumption that you know what the gospel is, and I make the assumption that you understand theology proper, I could be making a great mistake in building a major gap that you may not be able to overcome between now and next week when we start diving into it. So I want to lay a foundation today. Can I do that? Of which I'm praying that your soul is able to affirm. But we all with open face behold as in a what? Glass. That word can be translated mirror, okay? That word can be translated mirror. Behold as in a mirror. What are we beholding? The glory of the Lord. What Paul is talking about here is the Bible when it's illuminated. When the Bible is illuminated, it becomes a mirror. And in this mirror is an image. And that image is the image of Jesus Christ. When our Bibles are illuminated by the Spirit of God and we read it correctly, do we see Jesus in the Scriptures? Now watch this. Christ is the means of your transformation. As you and I look into this Word of God and we see God's working and His glory in Christ, and because we're born again, that look is a transformational look. There's a deep, profound connection between the believer and God through the Word. We're being changed on a daily basis as we interact with God through his word. So Paul goes on to say that we are changed into the same image from glory to what? Glory, even as by what? The spirit of the Lord. So there is the agency of the scripture. Then there is the transformational process that's taking place. But Paul tells us that's the spirit of God working. That's the spirit of God working. And this is what I call it when you and I are actually experiencing the sanctifying work of the Spirit of God, we're being born again, now we are starting to change. If it's really happening, this is what we call glory now. Glory now. When a man or woman is truly born again, they have experienced glory now. From the point of new birth, you have been prepared for heaven. And what's taking place on the inside is glory now. So whereas we are called saints of God, we are called children of the Holy One, and we are called those who are set apart for him, it's because we have experienced what I call glory now. It's Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. And so for the believer, he or she or they are constantly driven upwards towards God, are we not? Because a glory factor has taken place in your soul where you and I are contemplating eternity with God all the time. And in fact, it has so impacted you that it's changing your life. This is what I mean by effective data or transformational data in the life of the people of God. I have a couple of... Uh, uh, letters up here and I want you to see them uh, and what happens is what God does is he gives us information doesn't he that information is the Bible objective data information is the Bible and if that information is working right it brings about in our life or in our soul an affirmation you know what an affirmation is for saved folk amen an affirmation is for saved folks is amen when the Word of God is taught properly that objective truth penetrates your mind and your heart and subjectively you agree with it and your soul immediately goes what amen that's called affirming a thing so information leads to affirmation that repeated process leads to transformation this is why faith comes by what and hearing by what so information leads to affirmation the repeated process leads to what transformation transformation metamorpho is the term for an inward change an inward change i want you to get this now 
So when God comes to us in his word and it comes in power, it's information on the outside, data from the outside, data from heaven that penetrates our heart. And subjectively, we discover that it's true and it's so true that it leads to an amen in our soul. This is exactly the way it was for Father Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis 15 when the scripture says, and Abraham believed God and it was counted for righteousness to him. In the Hebrew, the word believed is amen, amen, from which we get the term what? Amen. So when we say amen, we are saying, I believe that. I believe that at the level of it making such an impact in my life that there are seismic shifts that take place in my soul. Now, now watch this now. Transformation is not an external thing. It's an internal thing. It's the work on the inside. Can I talk to you a little bit tonight? Right, this is really important because true religion is not about what we do externally. It's about what we are internally. Right, so information, objective truth coming from the outside in through the preaching of the word, by the power of the spirit, by a heart that's been opened up like Lydia, remember? And Lydia's heart was open that she heard the apostles and she believed everything that they said, had she having attended to the word. The impact of that word brought an amen, an affirmation, and it created a transformational process. That's what's taking place here in for, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. I'm changing. Are you? I'm changing. And this is in what we call a passive verb form. It's a present tense passive verb form. What that means is a change is taking place in me. Okay, so now when I say I am changing, I'm simply speaking in the first person present. I am not speaking in the active sense. I am changing myself. No, God is changing me. I am being changed. It is a passive work by a gracious God that is gradually moving me in a direction where I see things the way he sees them. Are you following me so far? This is very important, very important. So information leads to affirmation. Affirmation leads to what? And transformation leads to reformation. Reformation. Now reformation is when your life physically changes practically changes where you stop doing certain things because you stop thinking certain ways. You stop going certain places because you stop valuing certain things. This is where this class is going to be so critically germane to Saturday's class. For four weeks, I'm going to be pressing into our thinking what it means to walk by faith, what it means to know God, what it means to live as a principal person and therefore be a man or woman of God because you cannot be a man or woman of God unless you are principled. And you cannot be principled unless you have knowledge. And you cannot have knowledge unless you have faith. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Faith leads to an access of God's knowledge that brings about a life of principled conduct that leads to transformation by which you are discovered to be a godly man or woman. You don't just come to God and say, now let's do godliness. You have to become godly. And that takes all of this work right here. And this is why we sit under the word of God. A reformation life is the life of being a harlot and then all of a sudden being a missionary, not having skipped the previous points. A reformation life is the life of being a crook, a scammer, a hoodwink, to all, all of a sudden being an individual that is committed to the stewardship of the gospel on an honest level. A reformation life is a life of going from being an existentialist and so wrapped up in material things to where you become a person that is so committed to the profundity of essence versus ex externalism, as we talked about in our women's class, that you are so glad to be around real women versus shabby women and carnal women and materialistic women. Because, of course, the material girl, she old now, isn't she? Is she old now, isn't she? And still talking crazy, isn't she? But you know, things come and things go, don't they? 
And so, you know, when you become truly authentically saved, you are no longer given to uh, persuading people that you are something by what you have. In fact, ladies, when you are truly committed to the work of regeneration, you don't care about persuading nobody of anything but God. Did you hear what I just stated? It doesn't matter who believes you to be what, you know what's going on in your life. So this woman is coming one way, but she's going to leave a whole nother way. And I'm not going to let her go all the way back to the village without you guys learning 12 weeks of deep, profound, uh, transformational truth that comes from Christ to her in a way that applies to you and me. So as we work this through, uh, there are a few more things we want to uh, deal with, and that's just now start working through our first point. There are three stages of growth development uh, around maturing in Christ that I want to actually deal with uh, uh, relative to laying the foundation. Again, this is introduction. And some of this stuff is going to make a lot of sense over the course of the weeks. And so under our uh, three stages, I want to deal with what theologically we call uh, the new birth, the age of instruction, and then ultimately the age of application. The new birth, the age of instruction, and ultimately the age of application. You see it up there. Uh, we must admit that it is a process in the which very difficult and hard lessons can and will emerge to teach us what it means to grow in grace. Growing in grace is a process. Amen? But growing in grace is also a difficult process. Amen. And so growing in grace, which is a process growing in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter put it this way in Second Peter chapter uh, one, verses five through eight. Mark how Peter talks about the uh, practical application and maturity and development of our faith in Second Peter chapter one. This is what I want us to mark. This is an imperative that is a set of commands that I want you to think about over the course of this 13 weeks. And, and let's ask God to do this. I'm, in, uh, I'm gonna start at verse two and work my way through verse eight. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of, our, of God and of our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through a knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and what? Virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verses two through four are powerful. God bestows upon us the benediction of his grace. He says it comes through the knowledge of Christ. He says we are partakers of the divine nature and through it you and I experience the life of godliness that is a consequence of our union with Christ and we are partakers of his own glory. The construction there is not really good uh, by what it says in the last part of verse 3, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. It should be through the knowledge of him who hath called us to his own glory and virtue. Now watch this. This is what that means. When Christ called you, he placed you in the sphere of his own glory and virtue. That's where you are. You're in the sphere of it, his glory and virtue. Let me see if I can affirm that in your thoughts. Is Jesus wonderful to you? Is he glorious? Is he the most magnificent person you ever met in your life? Does he still attract you at the level of profundity? Is Christ boring to you? No. He's someone that we want to get to know more and more, right? More about Jesus, what I know, right? And, 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 and that's because you have now been brought into the sphere of his glory. Think about this now. Now, everything else that goes on in our world has what we call the law of diminishing returns, doesn't it? It gets old. Christ doesn't get old. Isn't that amazing? Right, because you have been placed into the sphere of his own glory and virtue. And because Christ is the very glory of God, an eternal glory that never ends, you and I are constantly amazed at this Jesus. This woman at the well was amazed at this Jesus, wasn't she? 
And you and I should be amazed at this Jesus. And this is what Peter is saying. And he said, and that amazement should impact us. Watch this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When God calls you, he calls you out of something into something else. He's calling us out of a world of corruption. You know what we used to be? What we used to be? That's a process. Because we steal some of that. You'll get that on Saturday. That, that, this is the thing that makes knowing yourself hard. I'm going to have a lot of fun with these married folks on Saturday because I think that sometimes we, we do our spouse injustice when we tell them, you don't know me. And I'm going to give the, 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 the opposite spouse a little ammunition. I'm going to say, she don't know herself. He doesn't know himself. So when you're telling someone to know you when you don't know yourself, you're giving them an impossible task. But once you come to Christ and you become uh, in a position where you are knowing him, because of his light and glory, you get to know yourself. You know that you are a mess. Do you know that yet? Right. And so we are working our way out of a mess by the grace of God because the lights are on. Is that true? Right. So let, when you go home tonight, let your husband know, you know what? I found out something about myself. I'm a mess. Now, he ain't going to say anything if he's smart because he already knew that. It's not going to get him a whole lot of points. So if he's smart, he's going to say, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. He's a mess too. That's a challenge. We're a mess. But the lights are on now. See, because once we were lost, when we were lost, we were a mess, but we didn't know it. Now that the lights are on, we know we're a mess, right? So it starts with true. Relationship has to be based on true. It has to be based on honesty. If you're not honest with yourself, you're not going to be honest with God. If you're not honest with yourself, you're not going to be honest with your husband. He's not going to be honest with you. Everybody hoodwinking. This is what we're going to learn in the marriage class. It's going to hurt, but you know it's going to liberate a few, to, few of us because Christ has an answer to our mess. That's what this series is all about. So um, having escaped the world, uh, escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, listen to this, verse 5 through verse 7. This here is the spectrum of growth for the believer in terms of the attributes that should emerge up out of the seed of faith. He says in verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your what? Stop right there. It is the presumption on the part of the writer that the people that are listening already possess what? Faith is the foundation. Without it, we do not please God. Without it, we do not have access to his blessings. So we're building on faith, aren't we? Now mark what he says. He says, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue what? So add to your faith virtue. Virtue can be translated this way, integrity. It can be translated character. It can be translated uh, the discipline of doing right. Now you know that's virtue, right? Because that's what we were not before we were saved. When we become saved, now we're working through the structural process of integrity. By God's grace, I am trying to be consistently right. Can I get a witness? Now, I didn't, I didn't have a motive before I was saved. Now that I say I'm saved, I do have that motive. I want to be consistently right. That's hard, isn't it? But see, this is all about, all about watch this now, self-awareness, self-affirmation, and then the process of self-development or the application of the principle of faith. He says here, add to your faith, virtue. Add to your virtue, knowledge. Add to your knowledge, what? Temperance or self-control. And add to temperance, what? Patience. Patience is the ability to endure up under trial. Hard one, isn't it? But you find that when you grow in Christ, now is this true? Is this, how many of you here, here have actually been in Christ more than 10 years? All right, good, so about 60% of you. Don't you know that you are more patient now than you were 10 years ago? Raise your hand back up if you tell me. Because if you didn't, there's a, there's a defect in your faith. 
Because one of the fundamental things that faith is designed to do is teach you to stand still. That is hard for kings and queens. That's hard for kings and queens. Because see, we want to just wave our scepter and get the thing done with in Jesus' name. Right? We just would get it done with. I claim it. I proclaim it. I decree it. Nothing changes. Do you know why? Because God is not into you getting things at your will. He's into the transformational process of making you like his son because his son for him is the most lovely thing in the universe. And rightly so because God himself is lovely. God has every right to love himself. And because his son is just like him, bearing his same nature and therefore his same attributes, wouldn't he love his son above everything? And therefore, if he loved us, wouldn't he want us to be like his son? So God really doesn't care what you want as much as he cares about what he wants for you. And this is where patience comes in. And a good parent is patient with their children because we believe in the process of growth. We're waiting for them to come into the full spectrum of their DNA, which, was, which is what we're about to get into. Our hope is in the DNA. Our hope is in the DNA. Our hope is in the fact that the DNA possesses everything in that cold spectrum that is necessary to produce in the life of that which we have brought into being a reflection of that which brought it into being. That's our confidence that the DNA possesses it. That's what God is saying. Here he says, add to your faith virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance to temperance, patience, and therefore what? Godliness. Do you see it? You're going to learn this on Sunday. When you and I are actually exhibiting godliness, it is because we are wearing patience well. We are wearing the garment of patience well, and that is called godliness. Is God patient? Is that one of his divine attributes? Exodus 33, 34, right? He is a long-suffering God. That's called godliness. Godliness is the ability to stand still, not act, not respond in a way, in a knee-jerk reaction, because you are sure that God is in control. That's hard, isn't it? There's a glorious concept. It's kind of far away from us, but, but we're getting there, right? All right, so let's keep working. A couple more here. And so temperance to uh, patience and patience to godliness and to godliness what? Brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. So do you see how faith actually ends up loving the people of God? Do you see it? How faith actually ends up loving the people of God. So now this is really important. We're going to move to our next point. When uh, faith has built uh, upon itself these characteristics and attri attributes, what it's going to look like in the spectrum of your life is love. You're going to have grown in your walk with God at the level where you're going to be able to love people, and particularly the people of God. Does that make sense? All right, so this is critically important. Now, going back, here it is. There are three aspects that I want us to deal with theologically now with regards to what I call the growth spectrum that is going to be important for our life. That growth spectrum is that starting point that you and I go through that leads all the way ultimately to glory. Uh, and this is within the context of the new birth. The first word that I want us to deal with is the Greek term gneo, gneo. You guys see that up here? Gneo, it's in your outline. You don't have to look up there. Look in your outline. You can see that word. Do you see it? It's under the three stages I wish to address. The new birth, the new birth. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 3? Except you be born again, you shall not see the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God. Except you're born of water and of the spirit, you won't enter in. The new birth is uh, the term gneo. This is the root form of it. And you can see the word Genesis in gneo, can't you? Can you see it? Genesis. What is Genesis? It's the beginning. In our theological spectrum, we call it the seed, don't we? Genesis is the seed, isn't it? Our seed theology starts in the book of Genesis. 
The conception of that seed takes place in the book of Exodus. We call the birth of the son of God, the nation of Israel, right? A typical picture of Jesus Christ, right? The birth took place at the Red Sea. When God called Israel out of Egypt, they were birthed as a nation, right? So we went from the Genesis to the Exodus. The word Exodus means to depart. So Israel departed out of the womb of Egypt to become God's son, right? That's Exodus chapter um around chapter 4 verse 20 on 22 where he says I have brought my son out of Egypt so the Genesis account leads to the Exodus account and is speaking to the new birth as I stated earlier you and I have to be sure that we are what born again born from above born anew those are the three adjectives that correspond to what it means to be saved I am born again that is a second time had a physical birth, now I have a spiritual birth. I am born from above, directionally, my rebirth came from God. I am born anew, that is, my second birth is not like my first birth. I am not the same person in my second birth that I was in my first birth. I am a new creature. I'm from above, I'm born again, but I'm also born anew. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's what? Right, so this is what it means to be born again. Understand, it's a vertical work. It happens a second time. It's different than our first one. And it's of a whole different uh, 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 tenor, our character. After the new birth, there is a Greek term that I want us to capture now. And this is the Greek word, uh, nepios. And uh, nepios is an interesting term. But yeah, so uh, let me go back here for a moment. This is in First Peter uh, chapter 2 verse 1 I want you to see this word first Peter 2 1 some of you have heard this before but maybe some of you haven't and so let's just let's just develop this before we move on I don't want to move too quickly Peter speaking to the church says in chapter 2 verse 1 wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and and envies and all evil speaking that's a list isn't it is that a list now church folk don't act like this right now watch it. Lay aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisy, all envies, and all evil speaking. Now when Paul, Peter uses the, the phrase here, it's a verb, lay aside, he's using the garment change motif that Paul uses. Remember, put off the old man, put on the new. Lay aside, take off that old garment, that old reputation of gossip and slander and evil speaking and malice. Y'all got that right? And put on a new garment, a new reputation that is rooted or depicted in what we call in verse 2, a newborn babe. See it? As newborn babes. Now, if you're truly born again, this, this language is describing what happens when the child comes out of the womb immediately. Arte geneto is the Greek term, and it means born right now as those who have right now been born again. I'm not talking a week later. I'm talking about right now. I saw eight of them with my own eyes and my wife. Boom! That big old baby came out of that small place. That was a miracle. I fainted the first time. I made it the rest of it. I fainted the first time. Because of the blood. The blood was too much, but the gospel's there too, right? Because out came water and blood. This is the new birth. So that first time was just too much, too much blood, too much blood. I got faint. They had to scoot a chair under me. I fell back. You know. But except you and I be born of the water and of the spirit, and except we're born through the blood atoning work of Jesus Christ, we never know what it means to be new creatures. So this word newborn babes means brand new right now. And what is the first chief sign of the health of the baby? A hunger for the milk. You know a person is not really transformed if they are not hungry for God's word. Call it a rap. Call it a rap. You, and you can't make people hungry for God's word. People can get baptized, they can get prayed for, they can have hands laid on them, they can be slain in the spirit, 
They can be knocked down, dragged down, picked up, washed off, cleaned up, spray painted. But if you're not born again, you will not have a hunger like the newborn babe for the sincere milk of the word. It's a disposition of the soul that's critical to affirming that you have been born spiritually and that the only thing that your spiritual man identifies with and yearns for is the very word that saved them in the first place. So that immediately upon being born again, you are on a trajectory of drinking in the word for long periods of time so that you grow. Y'all remember that period, that season? Where you were devouring biblical truth and devouring spiritual things at a level that nothing else really mattered. That's called a newborn babe in Christ. If that hasn't happened, there's still a problem. He says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may what? That Greek term there again is uh, genete, and then we move from genete from the milk of the word as an infant. In some of your translations, it'll be infant. An infant grows, and then he develops into what we call a child, a child. In the New Testament, the word will be called children because largely it's in the plural form, but a child. This is the Greek word nepios, going back to our PowerPoint, just to describe it. So our first word is geneo, born. Our next word is nepios, and nepios for us is a term that underscores what's happening when you and I are growing in God's word, where we are developing in God's word, where we are uh, now brought into a place of instructions. That's what the word nepios uh, means for you and I. Here's a verse that I want us to look at. Galatians chapter 3, 25 through 28. Galatians 3, 25 through 28. And you've heard this before, but I want you to see it again. The apostle Paul talking about believers. After that faith has come, we are no longer under the under a schoolmaster. You see that word schoolmaster? That word is pedagogon, and it means someone who is training us. Someone who is training us. Verse 26, let me see. For you are all what? Children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. He's talking about how we are under instructions, are being trained to be brought to maturity. Here's another way that this word nepios is used. It's in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 5, 13. Now here is where the apostle, uh, the writer to the Hebrews, admonishes the Jewish people who have a long history of knowing God's word, but because they were playing games and negligent, they should have been instructors of the word of God, but the writer says, you guys are still children. In fact, the word is called babes. I'm going to expand that. So we go from being born to a state of babes where we can go from the milk and now we are between the milk and solid food and our parents are nearby doing the basic educational things, right? Helping us say our ABCs. Helping us identify colors and shapes and patterns, right? Developing a consistency of discipline, being able to say, say mama, say dada, right? That's your nepios stage. Now watch this. In a nepios stage, the child is largely being spoken to, not speaking. The child is largely being spoken to, poured into, not responding in intelligible words. That's how a new baby in Christ is. When you first start in Christ, you are hungry to learn, and you really don't know enough Bible to tell anybody anything. And you should not. And you should find faithful mothers and fathers, faithful teachers that will help you identify the shapes and colors of biblical truth so that you can start negotiating and navigating your way through the fundamentals of the gospel. Am I making some sense? Right, so now watch this. He says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Got it? So when you're in milk mode, you are learning the fundamentals of the gospel. You're learning your Bibles. You're learning the framework of the Bible. I wish I had time. That, that's a series in itself. Some of you ladies have learned, right? There are people who call themselves Christians and don't even know the Bible that's in their hand. Is that true? How many books in the Old Testament? 
39. How many in the new? What's the totality? All right, see, so y'all smart enough to know that. Average Christian doesn't know that. They wouldn't know the difference between uh, uh, how many uh, gospels there are in the New Testament from how many epistles there are to what is finally the apocalypse, how many minor prophets, how many major prophets, how many poetic books, what the law is in terms of the Torah or the Tanakh. They don't know those fundamentals. A Christian should know those things since your Bible is the medium between you and God. These are fundamentals. Am I making some sense? This is, by the way, ladies, um, we have all this material. We started this class several years ago, and we dealt with all this. You can have it if you really want to go back to class and learn these things, okay? And it's all free because we don't charge for anything. He is a babe. Why is he a babe? Because he doesn't know how to handle the word. And what that means is he does not know how because he's not ready to speak for God. What I love about the Old Testament and the New Testament, this is what we call the analogy of Scripture, is that it supports its, itself and it supports each other when you properly interpret the Bible. It interprets itself and it doesn't contradict itself. Give you an example. This is in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1. If you recall in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was struggling with the call that God had given him because it was just fresh upon his life. Plus, Jeremiah was living in a time when church folk would just kill you and drag you and hide you under the dirt and then go on to worship, okay? So it was tough. Jeremiah chapter 1. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 1. God calling Jeremiah to be a minister and be a prophet of God. Go in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 1 so you can see it for yourself. And this is what I mean by not being ready to speak. I love what Jeremiah said. Verse 1, 2. And three, let me start at verse four. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I what? Set you apart. I'll talk about that later. And I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, ah, oh Lord God, behold, I can not what? For I am a what? He is describing Nepios to a T. The Greek word nepios means unable to speak. Unable to speak. Did Jeremiah just say that? In other words, within Jeremiah's own being, he had no sense of qualification to speak for God. That's a humble disposition that you have to have because there's a lot of people who are ready to talk for God but are not qualified. They're not qualified. They don't even know the fundamentals. And so they're kind of playing games like a little child that learns a few words and patches them together. And you can kind of make out what they say a little bit. They're not ready to be educators. And so a lot of people are like that in the faith. They think they're ready to teach, but they're not ready to teach. They are still in a nepios state. Does that make sense? Go with me now in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 11, Paul made it really clear as he uses it here. And this is really a critical point, too. I, I love what Paul said here. The analogy or the metaphor of it is vivid, and I think you will also see it. First Corinthians chapter 13, uh, he says over in verse 11, these words, the context is beautiful, but I don't want to get into it. He says, when I was a what? There's our word, nepios. When I was a child, the first thing he says is, I spake as a child. See it? That's just the way I spake. I spake as a child. I understood as a child. See it? I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a what? This is called growth, right? I put away childish things. See it? I put away childish things. That's our nepios uh, uh, stage of development. There is the next stage that I want you to consider now too. So we've gone from being born again, we've gone from that to a nepios stage where we are in relationship with our parents and they are largely teaching us but we're not ready to talk yet. We are now in what is called the paida stage. The paida stage is the stage of actual instruction where we are now learning some things, where we have been taught the ABCs, where we have developed language structure, and we can say, that is a ball. Mommy, give me the ball. We're under instructions. And then we are advancing in the stage where what the parents say to us is, when you play with the ball, don't throw it at your little sister. 
So we are in what is called the discipline stage of education in the padia stage. And that can be seen in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Hebrews 12, verse 7. It's an excellent way to look at this. Hebrews 12, verse 7. You guys have heard this one before. And this here is a good analogy to underscore what it means to be in the stage or state of instructions. Um, Hebrews 12, verse um, 12, 12, verse 7. Are we there? If you endure chastening. See the word chastening? That's another form of the word for padian. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as what? For what son is he whom the father does not what? Right. And largely, when you expand that term chastening, it doesn't simply mean the physical discipline as a consequence of doing wrong. It means to be corrected or instructed or to be taught. In fact, you guys know if you raise children, there's a thin line between whacking them and telling them, right? Right. Right, because there has to be the boundaries of what we call imperatives and disciplinary consequences if they operate outside of what we tell them, right? Because you want to hedge them in so that they can grow up in a way that's appropriate, true? Right, so what happens is as our children are learning, they're also exploring and their exploration is dangerous because they haven't learned the discernment necessary to stay in bounds. So when you and I are under instruction in a gospel way or a biblical way, guess what God is doing? He is showing us what's right and what's wrong. He is telling us what's good and what's bad. He is telling us what pleases him and what does not please him. He's helping us understand those things that make for the development of our character because God's aim for us is holiness. Does that make sense? God's aim for us is holiness. In fact, that's the tenor of chapter 12, where uh, the writer to the Hebrews, after 11 chapters of warning the Hebrew people not to return again to works religion and legalism and self-righteousness, he tells them, and don't be weary by the way God is disciplining you. Because people can get weary when God is God. But what we're not discovering when God is God is that sometimes we're out of his will. And when we're out of his will, God's not going to bend for you. God's unbendable. So we're going to run into the wall every time we do what we want to do until it finally starts hurting. And then God's going to say, I've been waiting on you. <laughs> I'm God, not you. Eventually we get the point, don't we? So now you know what's happening when we do? We're maturing. And guess what we're doing? We're learning what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. This is amazing. Because once we go from the babe state of desiring the sincere milk of the word and sitting in humility under sound teaching and sound doctrine, where we fundamentally keep our mouth shut until we grow to a point where we can actually talk for God as a consequence of both experience and discipline, we are now moving in a direction where we can teach others. Did you get what I just stated? Yes. We're moving in a direction where we can teach others because our knowledge now is coupled with experience. And an experience that bears the fruit of maturity where we are walking in submission to God. God doesn't want us telling people to do something that we're not doing. Y'all know what that's called, right? Hypocrisy, right? Right, and so the people that God qualifies to lead are the people who have learned how to submit under the chastening hand of God, who have developed in a state of maturity where they're patient and they're discerning and they have proven the good and acceptable will of God. And they have discernment. Again, that's Hebrews 5, 13. They have now been able to exercise the word of righteousness skillfully. They can rightly divide the word. They can show you where you are amiss in your conduct. There are three ways in which we err as Christians. We can err in doctrine. You guys know that, right? We can get our doctrine wrong. But we also can err in practice. 
That means we can get our practice wrong. That is how we conduct ourselves in light of doctrine. Am I making some sense? Here's another way we err too. We can err in attitude. Let me show you the three. I want you to get this now because if you really want to be a good teacher, you got to know all three. So we're in the what we call the parenting motif, aren't we? You guys know that we operate out of three major covenant paradigm schemes, don't we? The first one being what? Father, son. That's the Genesis 1 account. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness, right? And God taught Adam how to live and he gave him an inheritance, didn't he? Right, so we all know the parenting mode and in that parenting mode, the parents are dealing with their children in terms of, watch this. So when the parents instruct you, the parents want you to repeat back to them what they taught you or the teacher, right? The parent teacher. If you don't repeat back to them what they taught, what they taught you, then we know you haven't gotten the doctrine. Isn't that right? But when you can repeat back to us what we taught you, we go, ah, she got it. He got it. Now what we're looking for is the moral and ethical outcome of that doctrine in your life. This is Christianity. Christianity is a doer's religion based upon a knowing religion based upon a being. We are being, knowing, and doing. Is right? Being born again, growing in knowledge, and therefore walking in the fear and love and knowledge of God. Is that true? So watch this now. So when I get my doctrine right, I can get my deeds right. Bad doctrine leads to bad deeds. Good doctrine leads to good deeds, right? I shall love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength, and my what? Neighbor as myself. All right, so as a parent, father is looking for me to not only get the word right didactically, but to get it right practically. Is that true? Right. Now, I can get the word right didactically. I can even practice it outwardly, superficially. Ah, let's go back to parent mode. Now, y'all know, after we have sufficiently taught our children what to do, and we have sufficiently educated them in how to do it, there's one other thing we're looking for. You know what it's called? Attitude. Is that right? And here's the powerful thing about attitude. We can watch them wash the dishes. We can watch them make the bed. We can watch them take out the garbage, but they might as well not have done either through when the either three when the attitude is funky. Are you guys hearing me? So stay with me. This is why Father God rushed to his son Cain and said, Son, your continence is fallen. Remember that? He was so concerned with the way Cain was thinking because he wore it on his face. Some of us wear our mess on our sleeves, don't we? Yep. And if we're good parents, as we ought to be, we discern it in our children, don't we? Yep. And we can pick up when our children are aloof, when our children are evasive, when our children are defensive, when our children are short, when our children are manipulative, when our children are cunning, when our children are quick, when our children are agitated. In other words, when our children are like us. I said this to the saints in prayer a couple of weeks ago. Or maybe I said it in counseling. I love counseling. I said it in counseling. Here is God's wisdom for growing you and me up. He allows us to be stupid enough to want to have babies. <laughs> right, now watch this. This is true. So then we have them because we just think, you know, this is the most wonderful thing in the world, right? And then all of a sudden we find ourselves having to grow up all over again through them. All that same stuff that we were doing, they're doing. And if you actually understand the wisdom of God in that, you get to now grow up. Because you really didn't grow up and put a stamp on it until you had children that you have to now train and be patient with them and show yourself mature because now you are in a loving relationship by which you are now manifesting your maturity. Am I making some sense? It's an uncanny thing when that child sounds just like you. It's an uncanny thing when that child walks just like you. 
It is an uncanny thing when that child is slick just like you. Uncanny. And it's designed for you to hit your knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. And it's a wonderful thing when they grow up and start taking on mature attributes. It's a, it's a wonderful thing when they come through that adolescent mode. As I told you about, adolescent mode is all about me. Remember that? That's a tough period with raising kids. All about me. Once they move into servant mode, then you can see that it worked. It worked. It took a long time, but it's working. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Now you can see how you got to do this by faith. Louis, put the AC on and put it on 70 for me so I don't have nobody fainting on me. Um, you can see how this requires patience, raising children. Is that true? But, but can anybody bear record with me of the outcome? Raise your hand. Can you bear record with me of the outcome of your kids having overcome those adolescent periods and moving into a reasonable state of responsibility and handling business as they ought to? And only a few of y'all, well, okay, I, well, you're okay. Y'all better raise your hand now because this is for you. This is for you. This is not, this is for you. This is for you to understand that the reason why God has made the family the most important institution in the world is so that we can understand the paradigm of growth in an intimate way. And this is why you love them no matter what their stages are in. Because God loves us no matter what our stages are in. Am I making some sense? And, and, and if you stop loving them at a certain stage, it's clear that your faith is defective. You understand your faith is defective because remember add to your faith patience that's why I say you got to hit your knees again children will grow you up won't they they'll make you go by and die real quick won't they get that color in your hair The Paideia stage is a stage of being taught to the point of having learned. And when once you have learned, you move into this next word, which I actually love from Paideia. It's the word techna, techna, techna. And that word is translated children in the scriptures too. And if I were to put a synonym for it, it would be family likeness. So techna becomes the family likeness term. In other words, eventually you see the similarities in the kids on the physical level and on the practical level, and they go, oh, that's a gift stand for show. Got that? When you and I have reached the techno stage, we are taking on the family likeness of God. We are taking on the family likeness. Are you with me? The family likeness. Because see, Christianity is it's, it's, it's vividly clear today. It's not hard to know a Christian. We've done this for 2,000 years. Our Bibles are not hard to comprehend if we are serious about it. Is that right? And, 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 and the truth is plain enough that a wayfaring man won't err in it. And so when we are reaching a techna stage, watch this now, we are publicly demonstrating ourselves to be children of God. And, and people now begin to see those, those patterns. Children, go oh, they're children of God. I like the way this term is used. I'm going to just use uh, uh, just a, a couple of verses uh, for us on that. And that is, uh, go with me in your Bible to, um, let's say, Luke chapter 7, verse 35. Luke 7, 35. Uh, this is where Christ will use the term. Luke 7, 35. Um, again, and the term techna is the term for what I am calling family likeness. And it's a term that Christ used frequently uh, with his uh, disciples. And it's a term that John uses in 1 John. I'm going to use one verse in each place. Here is where Jesus is defending a false assessment of both John and himself. It says in verse 34, the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, he is a what? Gluttonous man and a what? And a friend of what? 
They missed him, didn't they? Can I, can I make a point right here right quick? This is, this is why you must learn who you are. Because if you don't learn who you are, you will be subject to let somebody else define you. Stay with me. This is a really critical point. Jesus, our master, was the most misunderstood man in the world. And had he been an existentialist, that is, had he been a person that was beholden to the opinions of men, well, this is what they called him, a wine bibber. Just because he loved to hang out with real sinners. He wasn't a wine bibber. He just hung out with wine bibbers. They called him a glutton just because he loved to hang out with people that eat like your pastor. He wasn't, he wasn't a glutton and neither am I. But people will call you that who misinterpret you. He hung out with tax collectors and whoremongers and all kinds of low-life people, but that didn't make him like them in his essence. And yet people said that that's who he was. So can you see how if the most perfect man in the world is misinterpreted, you're going to be misinterpreted too? Stay with me. Now watch this, watch this. It is important, therefore, for you to know who you are so no one else defines you. Got that? And they will. Religious folk will say, you this, you that, you this, you that. And you will buy into it if you are not grounded in essence. Look at the next verse. This next verse really underscores it. Jesus said, they said all this, but wisdom is justified of all her what? That's our word techna. Wisdom is justified by all those who act like God. Mm. See it? So now again, John said it in 1 John chapter 3. He said it plainly. He says, now the children of God and the children of the devil, they're manifest. He that worketh righteousness, he's of God. The one that's not working righteousness, he's not of God. Got it? John said, techna children manifest the characteristics of the family. Now we're going to move to the next one because this is important to get. This one is the Greek term huios, and this is our final one. So we've gone from being born to being under instruction, not talking, to being under instruction and learning, having learned, I'll come back here later, because the woman of the well at the well is going to go through all these stages for us. We've gone to the stage of the family likeness. Remember what they said about the disciples in the book of Acts? And we could tell that they had been with Jesus, right? Family likeness to now what we call the huios. Now the huios stage is a wonderful stage of development because it's the stage where father publicly affirms us as his children. So I'm going to use two examples here with the huios. Huios is a word that underscores you being a child of God because you are an heir and joint heir of God with Christ. Are you hearing me? Now, this doesn't matter to anybody but the father. The father cares about you knowing that you are an heir because the father possesses all things and that he cares that you know that you're an heir. He is going to inform you that you are an heir because your knowledge of your heirship is going to impact your life when you know who you are and what you have. Are you with me? This word is used in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, concerning Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3, 17, concerning Jesus. I love this. You guys remember this was at his baptism, remember? Verse, go back to verse 15. I want you guys to see this. And Jesus answering said to John, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all what? Then John allowed him to be baptized. Remember, John didn't want to baptize him. Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm here to actually fulfill all righteousness. And then we get to verse 17, 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God doing what? descending as a dove and lighting upon where? Christ. So to have the Holy Spirit, you must have Christ because the Spirit of God resides on Christ permanently. 
To have the third person, you need the second person. To have the first person, you need the second and third person. Do you guys understand that? Now watch what the first person, who is God the what? Father, says about God the Son, because God the Son has now publicly made himself known in the waters of baptism as the folk did last Sunday. Look at the next verse. Here it is. This is our huios verse. And a voice came from heaven. This is what we call putting my son on blast. This is how pleased the father was with the son's public manifestation. Watch it now. Saying, this is my beloved huios. See it? This is my beloved heir. This is the one that has a right to everything I own. Everything. This is God the Father saying to that people at that time from heaven, he's the one. He owns it all. Now remember, Jesus is some 30 odd years old. He went from the Nepioth stage through the, uh, the uh, Ganel stage, through the Nepia stage, through the Padion stage, through the Tecna stage. And here he is now taking on the final Huia stage, the sun. From here on out, where is he headed? Calvary. You with me? Now watch this, I want you to get this, because this is where we wrap it up. From here, he publicly honors his father as he suffers for his name. Can I help your mama with that? Uh, he publicly honors the father while he suffered. Anybody with me tonight? Yes. I need you to get this because this is important. So when we're talking about growing up in Christ, there's a point in our maturity where we understand that really when we have walked with God long enough, there's a point where suffering is a token of our heirship. When we have walked with God long enough, Okay, so I'm going to give you just a glimpse of this before we stop, because it's almost time to stop. So this woman at the well, I told you she's going to come one way, and she's going to leave another way. Now this woman at the well, I told you she was a complex lady, complicated lady, right? Calculate, calculated, crazy, committed. This woman at the well was committed. I'm going to show you how all this is true. Jesus knew that longitude and latitude would meet at the same time because God doesn't make mistakes. Are you hearing me? That there was this woman whose absolute life was a mess. And that the answer to her mess was a man that would meet her at a strategic point in time and have a conversation that would change her life. Do you understand? She would go through all these stages that we're talking about. And she would head back to the village with her head high, her mouth open, telling everybody about this man, being ready to take hits for him because he demonstrated such a deep and profound and accurate assessment of who she was that he was able to liberate her from her false self and bring her into her true self which was prepared for her before the foundation of the world and the man who came into this world for her. Are you hearing me? She is going to demonstrate for us what it looks like to be a huyas, not caring what anybody says because you are so clear on your airship with God that you are now compelled to let people know already knowing that you're going to suffer for it. But it really doesn't matter because you have just found a man that has allowed you to throw your water pot away and get busy with a whole new identity. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? And this is going to take 13 weeks because there's so much for us to learn in that, in that passage. There's one more verse that I want you to see in relationship to this that I love. And this, this is in the, uh, well, I'm just going to use it as an example. Let me see here. 
Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 17. Revelation 21. Right, here it is, Revelation 21, 17. This is the great promise of the book of Revelation. You can see its central fulfillment in the Lord Jesus, but it applies to every believer. Are we there? Uh, Revelation chapter 21, maybe verse 7. Try verse 7. Yeah, I think it is, verse 7. 21, verse 7. Yeah, I love this. Here it is, look at this. He that overcometh shall inherit some things, all things. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his what? And he shall be my what? Huios. Huios. Do you see it? Huios. Watch this. This is God saying, this is a big issue to me. Your growing up is a big issue to me. It's a big issue to me that you and I grow up to the level of our confidence as heirs of God so that we don't care what people think because we know who we are. And when we get to that level, watch this, God is willing to let other people know it with you, to give you comfort. See, if we don't work it through, the moment God said that, remember in Matthew chapter three about Jesus? You know the next thing that happened? The devil came along and said, okay, now if you really, the huios of theos, do this, do that, and do the other thing. Remember that? If you really, I heard God said the devil, I heard him. But now if you're really this, do this, that, and the other thing. You know what he was doing? He was redefining Jesus in his own image, making him an existentialist, turning him into a puppet to make Jesus do his own bidding. Did Jesus respond by doing his bidding? No. What, did, what did Christ do? He quoted scripture and shut him down summarily, didn't he? Do you know why? Because he knew who he was in Christ. And this is where you and I want to be able to get. We want to be able to shut him down summarily because we know who we are in Christ, don't we? We want to be able to shut him down because we know who we are. We don't want to wrestle with him. We, want, we don't want to debate with him. We don't want to talk with him. His tongue is farted. He's got a lot to say. He will hoodwink us in our emotions, in our intellect. He will hoodwink us in our rationale if we don't simply establish the reality of who we are in Christ and accept God at his word. But this takes maturity to do this. It takes maturity to do this. All right, I'm going to have to stop here for time's sake. And before we shut it down, you guys will have a, uh, an outline for... Um, for next week. We're going to pick up uh, next week dealing with the last few parts of our outline and then we'll get started in chapter one. Very, very profound. Okay, turn this over. There's a statement I want to make before I open the floor for questions and then we close it out. Uh, turn it over. Um, I quote this at the top of our outline, as it is in the natural, so it is in the what? Now, this is a quote from John chapter 312, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and I'm going to show you guys the connection between Nicodemus and the woman at the well. Show you how there is what we call the analogy of faith. And, and Christ lays out this principle because remember when Christ told Nicodemus, except you be born again, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. Remember that? Nicodemus struggled over that, didn't he? Remember that? He struggled over that. And our sister is going to struggle over Christ's proposition to her too, right? They're both going to struggle, right? And that's what you do when God hasn't taught you the gospel. You struggle over redemptive realities. And so here's the question that I, I'm raising here, or the proposition. As we engage this topic of maturing in Christ, we want to discover exactly what? Where we are in order to appropriately and effectively do what? Grow up in Christ in all things. So finally, what I want to say about this uh, fourth chapter that's going to be powerful to me is that it's remarkable, one thing. Uh, the fact that Christ is dealing with this woman is remarkable. I hope to make good on that. The second one is that it's what? Radically relational. Radically relational. We are defining what it means to be saved. To be saved is a remarkable thing. To be saved is a relational thing. To be saved is a what? Radical. Is it radical? 
Radical. But to be saved is also a what? Revealing thing. Do you see it? Revealing. Is there going to be a lot of revelation taking place in her life here? Lots of it. And that's how God works in our life. Is that true? If, 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 that, if that relationship is dynamic, I don't know how many years you've been in Christ, but it's revealing, isn't it? God just, he just takes it. You know what he does? He comes with his key and he walks into your house. He doesn't knock because he owns it. And he lets you know he loves you, but he getting ready to go through the closets and the shelf and the, gar and the garage and those little stashes you got, right? That's what he's going to do because he loves you enough to want to reveal to you actually who you are. And he wants you to know that he already knows all about all that stuff. See, this is what our sister is going to discover, right? He knows all about all that stuff. See, so a right relationship with God has to be about us knowing he knows. Because he wants truth on the inward part. And this is what I meant by revelation. So some of this might hurt a little bit of uh, some of us because, you know, we're not quite there yet. You know, we, we, we're not quite there where we can be real, for real, with God. We're in church. We're not in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? It's going to be tough. But see, liberation only comes from the light penetrating to the deepest parts and you discovering, no matter how wretched you are, that God is still there. You understand? And that the only thing you have to do is wait on him to help you up out of that mess. It's revealing, revealing. And then finally, the last one is what? Refreshing. Refreshing. Isn't salvation refreshing? The metaphor, the whole of this metaphor, watch over the next several weeks how these words come back again. See, 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 so where are we at? We're at a well. What are we doing? We're engaging a conversation about what? Water. That's what this dialogue is all about. And so our sister is going to serve for us a magnificent, magnificent, magnificent testimony of God's grace in our lives. Before we shut it down, a couple things. If you guys are new and you want to um, get our series of women's theology, we got a, our um, booklet here. You guys, most of you guys have one of these, right? How many of you guys got these? Yeah, good, good group. But if you guys want to purchase these, these are $10. $10. They have in it the fundamentals of theology, all of our past classes um, you can get for free through our online, uh, um, through our office, by calling the office. You can get all of them back going seven, eight years. We do a lot of theology. You guys, a lot of you guys have been there. I'm just making this available for you if you want it. If you really want to grow, you can get it. You can purchase this for 10 bucks and, uh, and get all the material. Years and years of really good stuff is great for you. If you already have it, that's great. Um, I want to open the floor so for us to do just a little bit of ministry right now. So I'll need a lady or two to take the mics and walk around. If anybody has any questions or any issue that we need to address by way of prayer or counsel, Let's do it. Cut it on and make sure it's loud enough. And any questions by anybody that want that may have a question about anything, a prayer request before we shut it down. An issue, a struggle. Everybody hold here. Nobody need a position. Nobody needs to talk about anything. We're all good. I'm Melody, put it to your mouth because and you got to turn it so we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I want you all to pray for me on uh, February the 16th. I'll be going in to have a hip replacement. Okay. And so just keep me in your purpose. You guys got that? Our sister Melody on the 16th of February needs prayer for hip replacement. Anybody else? Let's let's get at this before we go. Don't go away, not minister to. You got to raise your hand so she can see it. There's one over here. Don't go away, not minister to. Remember the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avail much. I guarantee you there's somebody in the house with a real struggle. You get an opportunity right now to actually have your sisters sympathize with you and pray for you. Also, let me say this about this class, which really is important when you are doing a uh, semester. Get a partner. 
Do the class with a partner if you can. You do know you, right? Do you know you? Do you know you're going to drop off in two weeks? Do you know that you are not going to do the homework assignments on your own? Because you're not that disciplined. That's the statistics for our church all around the world. Can I get an honest witness in the house? Don't, don't act like I don't know what I'm talking about. I do. And so you'll come back next week having gone seven days, not even reading your Bible, and particularly not John. And, and so what we do in our class, we ask our sisters to get partners to hold you, hold you accountable. So your homework assignment right now is to read John's Gospel, chapter 1, all the way through chapter 4. Because when we dive into it, you're going to understand, in order to understand the context, you got to get the big picture. And I'm going to be running. When we start, I'm going to be running. So you got to just keep up. So get a partner that will help stimulate your, your uh, discipline through the class. Or else, you, you know, it's going to be really hard. Particularly if you're new to Christocentric theology. It's going to be hard. But it will be a blessing if you do that. Um, question, uh, uh, do you have a question? You got to put it to your mouth. Yes, I just want everyone okay, to keep it to the mouth because you're keep you're, me in prayer because I'm still struggling uh, finding a place to live. It's been a struggle, and just keep me in prayer. No, they don't know you. They need to know your name. I'm Brenda Cooey. Uh, this is my mother, Alberta Malone, and I just want everyone to please keep me in prayer because it's been a real big struggle. Okay, so what we need from you, because this is a good 80 sisters in here, somebody, we need specifics. Don't we need specific? Like when you pray to God, pray specifically to God. I mean, he already knows. But when you pray specifically, you know what that means? You actually know what you are praying for. Because sometimes we're so general, we don't really know that what we're praying for. So some of us might have resources here. But we, we need to know specifically what you need. Do you want a mansion that's 5,000 square feet? I am, uh, I do have Section 8. Uh, I have a two-bedroom voucher. Okay. And I'm looking in the Bay Area and Hayward specifically. Uh, Can you live in Oakland? No, I can't go huh? to Oakland. You can't? How come? Oh, the because voucher won't work. Voucher, Got it. A uh, Hayward, Hayward voucher. Okay. Yes, it only lets me go um, Hayward, Fremont, Castro Valley, San Leandro, uh, um, Dublin, mm -hmm. those areas, but I prefer Hayward, but anywhere in them areas would be uh, well welcomed. I just, I'm just praying to get this place. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, you got your sisters praying for you on that. Anybody else? Do we have anybody else? Um, where are we at? Okay. My my name is Darnese. Hi, Darnese. Hi. First time here? Yes, it is. All right. You're, in the, you're from the Bay Area? I am. Awesome. I just moved back to the Bay Area. I was um, living in Fairfield. Okay. Um, and I just moved back to okay. the Oakland area. Awesome. And on Monday, I heard you on the radio. Okay. And, um, yeah. And it brought me out. But, um, yeah. Well, I hope God, you enjoyed so the class so far. I did. Good. I did. And um, I just I want to ask for prayer for myself um, as... Uh, he indicated I'm one of those ones that's complicated, crazy, committed, calculated, and complex. Awesome. So I'm asking for prayer um, for my strength in all of those areas, um, being a child of God. And, and, your, that, so. and your name again? Darnese. 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 Darnese what? Gordon. Gordon. All right. It's a pleasure meeting you. Anybody else? Anybody else? We got somebody else? I'm um, right here, right up front. Anybody on this side, don't be afraid. Listen, if you need prayer, do it tonight. All right, if you don't, cool. I'm just saying, don't be afraid. Let's talk about it. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have people praying for you. Hi, my name is Wanda Olden Ross, and I am soliciting prayer for my family. Okay. We lost my mother last year, and I didn't realize that my mother was the God of all of my yes. siblings. Yes. I'm the youngest of nine, and I've been carrying this torch. And I'm drained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. you can run, mm -hmm. but you can't hide. Mm -hmm. And I know that God is my hiding place. Mm -hmm. But I'm tired. Yeah. I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I have a sister that's bipolar. Mm -hmm. She's been in the hospital for 365 days, 64 days, excuse me. Mm -hmm. She got out a day before her birthday. Mm -hmm. I work in Oakland, I live in Tracy. She was in the hospital in Sacramento. So I've been driving that freeway like nobody's business, encouraging her, talking to the doctors, nurses, going through at work, and still believe in God. Because one thing I know for sure is that he cannot fail. Right, right. And as of right now, I don't want to give up on my sister, Amen. but I don't have anything else to give. Right. The last time I was at the hospital, I prayed with her. I tried to encourage her, and I told her, it's your life. Mm -hmm. You have to make your choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as of right now, she's back at her same old deeds that yeah. got her into the hospital, mm -hmm. which is alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I pray for my sister, Baby Lopen. Mm -hmm. I pray that God will save her soul. That's the only way that I can pray for it now. Mm -hmm. Lord, mm -hmm. do what only you can do. So I pray for my family, my older brothers. My mother was their God, and I'm angry. Yeah, come with it. Come with it. Yes. You can come with it. We know something about that, don't we? Yes. Wait, we know something. We, see, this is, this is how you do ministry. This is, it don't work to have this stuff bottled up. I come in. I sit up under the word of God. When I get on my knees, the only thing I can say is, Lord, help. Yep. 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 Help me. I just ask for the prayer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of my family here at church. Mm -hmm. It's because I was on the phone. I was one of those that sit up in the church mm -hmm. for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And when the devil comes, you can't dance, you can't clap, you That's can't right. run around the church, yeah. and you can't babble. Yeah. So I thank God for you, Pastor Jesse. I've been coming mm -hmm. to this church for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until the latter part of last year that I went to the new members classes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I didn't want to make a commitment, but I had a whole bunch of junk. Mm -hmm. And now I'm coming to God just as I am. That's right. Come on with it now. Come on. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I love it. Man, that's what I love. Yeah, see, that it gets, that's the way it's supposed to be. Right there. We can play church or we can come to Christ. And we can be authentic with one another. See, this, this is where people are when they come. And this is why you have to actually have an authentic fellowship. People have to be mature in Christ. Immature people, people with wrong attitudes, would take advantage of my sister. But I kind of know my sister. I've been with her a little while. She's a thug sister, so don't try to take her the wrong way now. She crying because she in need, but she will get in your tail if you come the wrong way. And, and I don't have a problem with that. See, what we are trying to do is really walk with God. So now at this level, here's what's important. Here's what's important about this. This level requires maturity, and I told you that maturity is getting beyond ourselves because adolescent is all about me. Maturity is about interdependence, cooperation, right? And having the confidence in God that if you get a healthy circle around you, then you can begin the process of recovery or overcoming. A lot of what my sister is dealing with, so many of us deal with. And she's at her wit's end. Is she at her wit's end? Yeah. Do y'all know what that's like yeah. when yeah. you keep running across the same situation over and over again? Particularly when we're dealing with uh, bipolar, manic behavior that is outside of the scope of our ability to deal with. And we're calling on God. But our tank is empty. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. An empty tank. So, do you know how the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous person yes. avails? Yes. 
It does. You know how a person who is actually given the assignment to be a blessing to our sister helps? Mm -hmm. So somebody's got that assignment because we put it on the body. All right, let's keep going. And then over to Sammy. No, Go over to Sammy. Oh, my sister. Wanda. 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 Mollis, come on. I just want prayer for, um, I don't feel that hunger for God's word in the sense I always feel more like it's kind of a duty. I don't feel like I'm reading like a love letter from, you know, a man that I'm in love with. And I don't know if that means I'm not saved, but I would like to have more assurance about my salvation. I still feel like I, when I hear things like Pastor just said tonight, I start to wonder. I feel like my faith is more in my head, in a sense. I don't have that emotional thing that Pastor is talking about. So if that is something, if that's an indication that I What have emotional faith, thing? I what emotional like, thing? Well, you, like, just that, that, that just, that delight where you want to soak it up, soak it, I've never So that's called, that. that's called passion, yeah. So I'm you never, passion. you never had that? No. Never? I don't think I have. Okay, well, we need to, we need to pray for you on that end. So I maybe need to, I don't, that might mean, if I'm not saved, I want to be saved. Of course, me too. Don't you, don't you want to be saved? Yes. If you're not saved, I'm not scared to say it. The one of the problems, one of the problems of religion is people presume they're saved and never want to be honest and say, Lord, if I'm not saved, save me. If I'm not saved, save me. Because there's a whole lot of people that will stand before him on the last day. He'll say, I never knew you. And what we do know is you can know. So we'll keep you in prayer. I also need, I think another thing is hindering me back. I don't know how to let go of my clutter without kicking and screaming. Oh, well, you can kick and scream. God don't care. We still love you. I just don't know how to do it. Also, I'm afraid because I'm working on becoming, a, uh, trying to become either a cheater, a, a, teeter, a tutor, or a teacher. And I just feel kind of scared about how to handle all the administrative stuff of, of, of um, that. So, and I don't feel the energy that I feel like I should have. And so I just have lots of fears. So that's Marlis, you guys. Anybody else? Right here, my sister right here, Miss Kemp. And one up here. Talk to me, sis. And, well, and put I it to your know. mouth. Put it to your mouth. Okay. There we go. Um, my sister-in-law goes back to court tomorrow for a plea deal for being addicted to over, uh, prescription drugs mm -hmm. and having an accident. Yeah, you got to talk into your mic because Almost they... Almost two years ago. It'll be two years in June. And she goes to court tomorrow for her plea deal because she caused an accident with right. two people. Right. And um, other than that, the rest of my family, I don't think any of them truly know God. Yeah. They say they believe in God, but none of them go to church. I'm the only one out of the whole family yeah. that is trying to be a light. And I feel that when I'm not around my family, when I'm around my family, they bring the worst out of me. Yeah. So I'm not really around them. Yeah. And I just really want prayer for my whole entire family, my mom and mm -hmm. my brother, mm -hmm. my sister. My sister's bipolar. Yeah. And, and she's a mess. Yeah. And she's got a one-year-old child, and she's not talking to me because it's all about her. Mm -hmm. and, and, and no one's tried to help her. They've just enabled her. Right. And um, I just feel like... I'm not a light to them like I could be. That I really want prayer to be more bold. Yeah. To be a light to my family because I do worry about my mom mm -hmm. and my family's salvation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My mom's been with her boyfriend for about 19 years. He was an ex-drug dealer. Mm -hmm. And now my mom runs a head shop in Merced. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I'm not proud of it. Mm -hmm. And it's bad mm -hmm. and it's not good and I'm not around my family very much and mm -hmm. I just I worry about their salvation and where they're going to go yeah yeah so we're going to join you in that one are we not saints we're going to join her in that one give, give them your first name Julie Julie um, so yeah yeah I'm glad you shared 
Glad you shared. We are called, according to the word of God, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, and, and we will be waiting for God to come through like he comes through for us. And uh, we'll be able to have a testimony on some of this, won't we? Because that's just how God works. When we humble ourselves and walk in the maturity of interdependence instead of isolating and keeping it to ourselves. Uh, did, some, did we have somebody right back here? here? Right here, right here, Jessica. Hello. And you got to put it to your mouth. You guys don't drop just, okay. and turn it this way. All right. Yeah, this way. There you go. My name is uh, Jacia West. I live in Palo Alto. And there's no point in me coming across the bridge and sitting here and acting like everything's okay. I have a son that's um, bipolar and schizophrenic. He goes to court February the 9th. I've been going to San Jose every Monday for a whole year, and he'll be transferred to Napa. His name is Sherman West. I would like you to pray for him. And I have another son that I go to jail and visit in Redwood City. He'll be out in 10 months. I have a mother who is, um, has a dementia. She is 87 years old. I live with her, and I take care of her. I'm a nurse. I go to work Friday nights at 11 work 40 hours straight through and I get off Sundays at 3 o'clock. Uh, my patient is on 41 and she's in hospice and she has dementia and Alzheimer's and I just give and give and give and uh, I look forward to this Bible study this is when I get to come to church and yeah. and be with the sisters and I, I, I'm, you know, I, I smile and people don't know it but I'm, I'm mentally drained. Yeah. I have bags on my yeah. eyes now and uh, within the last year I've gotten a high uh, cholesterol mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. And I'm working on my diet. And I started exercising last Monday, and I lost a pound last week. Ooh, right. come on! I came to this church. I was homeless. Yeah. You know, when I told Pastor Jesse, he asked like he wasn't up. He said, "That's all right. God's gonna find a place." Right. I, and I'm like, "Did you hear what I just said?" <laughs> and you know what happened? My mother, God, my mother had a big four bedroom house. She didn't want anybody to live with her. God came to her in a dream. And my mother let me come in. Open that right. door. Open that door. Open that door. And I just got a, car, a brand new car last week. My credit score was so Thank bad you. because I had five grown children raised. You trying to pay their tuition and stuff. Yeah. And I got a car. We know all about it, sis. My credit score was 562. Do you know I have a brand new car that I got That's last right. week? That's right. That's right. That's what I'm saying. God is still with us, whether we drain or whatever's going on, and I just want to be saved, and I just want, I'm going to sit here and say, oh, I ain't saved, but I just want to grow. I just want to grow more That's right. and be saved. That's right. Thank God Amen. 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 Mother Banks, any, any other sisters back there? Okay, right here. Uh, so what did you need to say? I just, you know, I have to be truthful. I'm tired too. Uh -huh. I am so tired. Mm -hmm. Pray for my son. I also have a son mm -hmm. who is fighting with the methadone. Mm -hmm. I've been there, so I know what he's going through. But with God, I came out of it. Yeah. 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 I came out of it, uh -huh. so I know he can. He can. But I can't seem to talk to him. Um, I tried talking to him and letting him know what it's doing to him. It's doing nothing but killing him. You know, I actually see my son like dying in front of my face. And then he's the one that I have to help. I'm struggling finding a place to live. It's been a lot on me. So and I, I, I have to tell you guys more. I really do. You don't find a place. Uh, I just, I, you know, I, I, I had no transportation. The, the Lord has blessed me with that. Someone gave me a car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gave me a car. Yeah. And I just need more prayer from all of you. Because I do. I walk around like there's nothing wrong with me. But at night, I'm always on my knees just 
Other sister, was that, was there other, another one over there, Mother Banks? You, what, what do you have to say? Yes, I. You got to put it to your mouth, Mother, because they can't hear you. Just as if I pray for me, you know, I had a little stroke about a couple months ago, so I put it to her mouth for her. No, kind of having uh, trouble with that sometimes. Mm -hmm. But the Lord uh, showed me the other day. I was praying. And he showed me that there was one day, precious one, one thing that stands between us and him, and you know what that is? Believe it. That he is. Believe it that he is. All things are possible to be on that believe. And you can't come to God except you believe that he is. All of our problems are nothing. One thing that stands between us and God. That's believing. So precious ones, along with Sister Banks, let's trust, let's test our belief. What do you think about God? Are we just reading words? Are we just, there's no door that he can't open. That's right. There's no mountain that he can't climb, but you've got to believe. Yes. And that's a believing to action. None of us in here believe that we came up here in an airplane. How many of you is going to get up from here going out there expecting an the airplane to be set? <laughs> Nobody can tell you that you didn't come up in that, that you came up in an airplane. You know you didn't. <laughs> so you're not going out there to get on an airplane. Right. So let's look at our belief. What we really believe in God. And so all things are possible. To let's Ask the Lord to help us with our unbelief. Say that come and take you're not saved, you're not worthy, you're not this, and when you know anything, you're down in that battle. Believe in him. But when we can believe that God is a God that cannot lie. So let's check our belief. My name is Alexis. Now you got to put it to your mouth. Oh. There you go. I was trying to do the game. You, no, yeah, you are. That's cool. But put it to the mouth now. Okay. You can okay. kiss it. Can you can you kiss it. Now? You can kiss it. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So my name is Alexis Wiley, and um, I have three beautiful children. And um, back in August, I, I was 17 weeks pregnant, and I lost my baby boy. And I delivered him at the hospital. And I know that that was the Lord, and I know that he provides, and I know that he gives us strength. Um, but what I'm asking for is, I'm 10 weeks pregnant right now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I would ask for your prayers yeah. that I will not, That's the right. Lord would allow me to deliver a healthy child. Amen. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, expand the glory of the Lord. Yes. So. Yes, indeed. We with you, sister. We got all that. Any more? We only been talking for 12 minutes. We can do ministry for 15 minutes. Can we do ministry for 15 minutes? Yeah. Can we care about our sisters for 15 minutes? Yeah. All right. I just wanted to say that I did not want to come here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, my sister. I, I, like, I, like a, I like a sister telling the truth. <laughs> Tell the truth. I First of all. Movies, I was like, no. Nah. I'm in Antioch. I'm like, no, no, not tonight. But you know, I um, my name is Deborah, and I have really been empty. And I just thank God that I 
this is a safe enough environment. When I heard the sisters start to uh, begin to express their feelings, I was like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And I just want to appreciate how much God loves us. Mm -hmm. Because everyone here, I, I'm, I, I just feel the love. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I really appreciate the, the learning, the teaching. Um, I'm really needing some understanding. Amen. So Amen. I, I thank God that Carmel, uh, she invited me last year, and I was like, oh, girl, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. But I didn't come. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm glad. And you're another year, Deborah, you're another year younger, too. You're another year younger. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, we ain't. We only reach our women only reach nineteen in here. Nineteen. That's all. Nineteen. Nineteen. That's right. Just, that's right. Is it? Isn't it a nineteen in you? All right. That's a, there we go. There we go. I just prophesied. There we go. There we go. That's right. Anybody else before we get at it over here? Um, we can do we can do ministry before we get out of here. Um, oh, my what name is oh, right here, right here. Okay. Um, my name is Shakesha. Um, I've only been a year here yeah. at the church. Yeah. Um, but I want to say that I'm very encouraged. Amen. And um, this ministry is an answer to prayer. Maybe about six. No. Let's go back. 14 years ago. So for me. Mm -hmm. Come on with it. Keep the mic to your mouth. You can do you can talk. Let it out. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful because I know that I had struggled and I have continued to struggle with knowing who I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it hurt and hurt and said, God, I see me. Mm -hmm. But what is it? Mm -hmm. Acknowledging and being truthful. Mm -hmm. I don't want to let go. Right. It's I, I know I should, but I don't want to. Right. But thankful because um, even when you don't want to let go, he will still reach for you. That's right. And so that's been encouragement for me. So what I'm thankful for is that <laughs> it may take 14 years, but he answers prayers. He continues to work on you. He even lets you go and do stuff. <laughs> Sound like she know our God, doesn't she? <laughs> Sound like she know our Savior, doesn't she? And you're like, really, God? You can still, you still love me? Uh huh. And all I know is the more I've matured and I've grown and I've grown, mm -hmm. the more I'm like, I'm a mess. Yeah. You said that. I said, oh, yeah, I said it every day. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I laugh at my husband. He says. And he just looks and he goes, <laughs> but, um, but I just want to say, continue to keep me in prayer because God is continuously revealing things and it's hard. I'm at a, I'm at a, it's hard and I'm scared to be very honest because when you don't know mm -hmm. really who you are, you're afraid mm -hmm. of what that is. Mm -hmm. Because you, all you've ever thought was everything someone else has said about you. That's right. Or what other people have said, and you're back and forth, and you feel confused, and you're like, but God, I know that this is who you are, and so you continue searching him. But I will say the one thing he is beginning to show me in everything is that he is sufficient for all things. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And I can't stress it enough, and I have heard this before, but I never understood it. Mm -hmm. And it took him showing me through so much that mm -hmm. he is enough, and I'm still trusting in that. So mm -hmm. just keep me in prayer, and mm -hmm. I want to encourage you mm -hmm. all, whatever that you are going through, whatever he's pulling you through, you are here for a reason. He is grabbing hold of you. Um, and I pray that you go through the process. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Come on, let's get at it. Any more before we pray? Shaniqua. Hello. So I was sitting here thinking that tonight, or really the start of this series, is like, 
my anniversary with coming to Grace, because five years ago, I started coming in the middle of Beauty for Ashes. Yes, put, put, put it to your mouth. Yes. And so what's really interesting, at that point is I was coming out of an abusive relationship, so my emotions were certainly clouding my judgment. There was no judgment, there was just... Mm -hmm. A fog. A, yes, mm -hmm. and so Pastor Jesse, ironically enough, or by God's grace, said a couple of things tonight, like, the lights had been cut on that he said five years ago, and I was like, yes, I still needed to, I still need to hear, mm -hmm. even though God has brought me through so many things in five years, I still needed to hear how important it is for God to cut the lights on. Yeah. I'm not going to do it myself. That's right. And so I wanted to mention that because I know that we have some uh, first-time ladies to theology or first-time ladies to this women getting to know women process in, in general. And so one of the blessings for me five years ago was to be able to sit in the communion with other ladies and really be able to soak up the same experiences and really be able to lean on each other. So it's it's really important to be able to have what Pastor Jesse said we need is a, a partner yep. in this yep. journey. Yep. Um, the sisterhood, I never felt more connected than I have. And I was telling one of the sisters um, a couple of days ago that we have this little group. And I was like, you know, one of the common denominators of this group is that we all had sort of weird issues with women, but it was by the, God's divine grace that he brought us together. Women who are sort of instinctive, instinctively saying, I need to stay back from women because we're shady, faulty women. But he was like, he brought us all together so that we can lean on each other and help each other through that because that's not really what sisterhood is supposed to be about at all. But then I just wanted to say in connection to the Samaritan woman that his, his plan for her was so graciously relational and so graciously purposeful. And I'm just like, thank you, Lord, for bringing me back five years in a very different place, still have all the, the raw emotions, but I'm not, I don't feel so much as in the, so much as in the infancy. Yes, still need yes, that milk, still yes. need that living water. Yes. But he has prepared my heart in such a way that I'm able to take it in and say, yes, more, Lord. There's yes, no running, there's yes, no resistance. Yeah. There is a new inclination. And yes, it's difficult. And yes, it's hard. And yes, there are times where I'm like, I don't want to read another anything. Yep. But then yep. it's like, you need it, you need it, you need it. And I have some sisters here who have just been pushing on me, pushing on me, challenging me, commanding me to, you know, stay with God. Yeah. Obviously my great grandmother is yeah. super wise and dope, but you know, I just I just wanted to share that because I don't I know that it'll be easy to run away and this the sisterhood is for real here and whatever sort of concerns you may have, those are legit concerns, but, you know, link up with women and let's, you know, we got to do it because we need each other. And I, I really do believe that you're going to grow through this. Series. Absolutely. Really study, Absolutely. study the Samaritan account because it's, it's talking to me and I, it's got to be talking to you too. Amen. 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 Is that it? Um, all right. Just some requesting prayer to I, I, I. This is my 12th year here at Grace, and I've grown tremendously. Maybe more so in the last two years. Um, I have some amazing sister friends, um, and you know my pastor, of course. My prayer. Hold on, is, say that again. Your pastor, what? <laughs> what about of your pastor? Course. <laughs> I've just learned a lot, and my prayer is to just. Um, um, fully trust in the Lord and to find my security in Him. Yeah. Not another person, yeah. no matter how close they are. Mm. You know, my mom and I are extremely close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but to find my security in Him and only Him. Yes. Um, and that that is my, my prayer request. Yes. I, I feel like sometimes I'm Mm -hmm. You know that, that trust game where you fall back into the person's arms? Yeah. You're reluctant to do it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of like, okay, you got me, you got me, you got me. But I just want to just fall, right. you know? Um, so my prayer is to trust and to um, continue to um, 
find my security in him. Amen. I'm getting there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is great. great, great, great. All that's so good. Yes. You have no idea how important this is. The, the tenor of the questions and observations are good. We'll take you in a second, Mom. It's really important, ladies, for you to have a biblical faith that you can solidly affirm through the scripture and then on an experiential level uh, be able to do what Alina is saying. So we're learning what it means to lean fully on the Lord. This is a, a, a process, okay? It is a process. And so don't, don't despair. Don't despair. Tremblingly depend on him. Tremblingly depend on him. Shake, go through the fits and jitters, but tremblingly depend on him. And for those of you who have found him to be a refuge in the storm, make it an assignment that one of these sisters who are saying, Lord, help me, make it an assignment to pray for them and to encourage them, if you're part of this body, to encourage them. Because see, that's what, that's what you all need because we're talking about growth on a spectrum. We're not all at the same level of growth. Okay, so, so understand, this is not a me thing, this is a us thing. We're almost done. My sister. Okay, my name is Teresa, and I'm asking for special prayer with my husband passed away a month ago. Okay, okay. Uh, prayer in what way? Put it to your mouth so I can hear you, Teresa. Just strength. Okay, that's all? You, you want to say a few more things? Uh, Comfort uh, for you or the family or just you? How long? How long uh, had your husband been? How you you've been with your husband? Eighteen years. Yeah, eighteen years. A long time. So it's going to take a minute. You're grieving? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, he's, he's been ill for over ten years. Okay. 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 You guys got that? You guys got her name? May the Lord, Teresa. Teresa, you got that? Um, how, many of you, how many of you guys know the virtue of prayer? Raise your hand. All right. All right. So if you do, this is what you do. You talk to God every day, any time of day, any form, posture, position, emotional disposition. Prayer is not heard or received by the level of your passion or emotional disposition, but by the sincerity of your confidence that God hears you for Christ's sake. So we have to distinguish between emotions and faith. If you don't make that distinction, you will always judge whether or not God is hearing you by how you feel. And nothing in the Bible ever demonstrates that God only responds to our feeling. Passion is different than mere emotion. We will work through that as we deal with the woman at the well. Before we go into prayer, we're about to go into prayer. Our four-week series on rules of engagement for husbands and wives are going to be dealing with a lot of this. Because I said, as I said in the opening of our class, two people under the same roof having these same kinds of struggles in an individual way is what makes marriage so difficult. And unless we are really striving to be defined as persons biblically so that our souls can be anchored in reality and find the help we need, then what we do is we kind of just quietly go back to our caves or our octagons because that's what they are for a lot of marriages, octagons or caves, right? Right? Because we actually don't have an assignment when we go home and we need an assignment. You ladies need an assignment. If you are wives, you need an assignment. Your husbands need an assignment. We just need an assignment. Marriage does not grow healthy by accident. 
It's an intentional process that really does require some understanding of who we are. So I'm, I'm praying for that as I've heard the frustrations and illnesses and, and, and emptiness of our sisters. We know that's the case. I'm a pastor that's extremely attuned to what's going on in our nation and our world. Just my job allows me to do that. And so I, I know what's going on in the hearts of our sisters. Here's a secret. It's also going on in the hearts of our men. Our men just put up a better facade than our sisters. Do you understand that? And so try not to be at war with your men. This battle is spiritual. It's not your spouse. It's not your spouse. And when you grow and mature, God's going to give you the tools that you need to put that man in his place in your own conception of things so that God can deal with him while you do what Alina is asking for so keen. We have a tendency to seek refuge in other things. And we are especially vulnerable to that when we are married. Right? And we want God to teach us how to find our ultimate sufficiency in him. So that even though we have the responsibility of interacting on a dependent level with others, that process does not determine my ultimate well-being. But neither do I want to be the kind of spouse that basically cuts my husband off because I really don't know how to deal with him either. Some of our husbands are like our sisters talking about their children or siblings who are, you know, bipolar and, you know, manic. We're empty. We don't know what to do, right? We don't know what to do. So make it an assignment on your part to really grow. That requires courage. That lady stayed at that well all day long. She didn't go pee. That's a little humor break for you. <laughs> because she was captivated by a man who graciously drew her all the way in. All the way in. You understand? And she, she realized this is, this is the moment. And that's what we want. So we can go away changed. Clarissa. Um, pray for me. I could be my own worst enemy. Um, I ask the Lord, I want to grow and mature. But if I have time from work and here and get relaxed at home, I find excuses not to come. And then I feel. And your some mic is dropping on you too. And then I feel some kind of way when I don't come because I pray for it. So. I don't know if, if I'm asking the Lord for strength or I don't know, but I know I can be my own worst enemy and I want to be here. I have to be here if I want to mature and grow because you're teaching these classes on that this year. And I just, I make excuses. I can't leave my mom. Yes, I can, mm -hmm. because I can have somebody watch her. Mm -hmm. And I'm too tired. Not really. I can drink some coffee and come. I just make these excuses, and I'm tired of the excuses mm -hmm. that I make, because mm -hmm. I enjoy being here. When you, when you make it. <laughs> when, you act, when you actually get here, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. just from point A to point B, huh? Yeah. You know, I always think, you know, well, I mean, the Lord 
Laura gave me a prayer partner a year ago, but that failed. But we were accountable for each other, and it was easier. And I need to stand on my own two feet. And I need to be accountable for me, you know, to get here. When I say I want to be here, I want to be accountable for where I want to be. Does that make sense? You know, I just, and, and I, I, I pray to God because I want this bad, you know, and sometimes it's, it's just hard, you know, with, you know, the kids and, you know, and, and the, the disrespect in the home and, you know, me just really just trying to stand on what God says, and I'm just so persecuted. You know, they're trying to force me into, you know, their simple lifestyle, and and I'm, you know, and I'm just, you know, saying, telling them, you know, that it's wrong, but I love you, that's your road, you know, that's you, and that's between you and God. You know, I don't have to, you know, like what you do. You know, that's you. You know, but, you know, it's like, they're all around me, and it's like, I get it from all ends. And I tell, I mean, I got weed heads for kids, all, every last one of them, except for the baby. And they know how I hate that with a passion. And they still come to the house hot. And, I, and they know how I feel about it. And even if I say something about it, it's like, they don't care. They just come in with the disrespect. And, and like, I'm an alien, like, mom, this is like, everybody does it. I mean, it just really bothers me. And I, I just, you know, I pray to the Lord. You know, I know that's their road, and that's between there and God. But it really, really bothers me, and I allow it to affect my relationship at times with God. And I constantly have to apologize because I know his word, you know, and, you know, he chooses to save and not save. And his all right, so, all right, so, all right, all right, hold up, hold up, hold up. We love you. But see, so you know, you're going on. Because you don't have to. We don't, and someone will stop you. So that, because for time's sake, because you don't have to do that. Because now you're going into preaching to your kids. So I want you to hear what I'm saying. So, because uh, this is important. We're all, we, we, quite a few sisters, they already got that struggle. I don't want you to go into that. So that's part of where you have to grow. Can I say something? This is a better story than, and I don't ever give up on God. You can't. I have cancer. And about, I'm trying to think, oh God, has it been? Six months ago, I could hardly walk. The medication they put me on made me so weak where I could hardly go up the steps. And I, I'm 79, I'm not young, 79 years old, you can see that. But that's a better story that I've heard. But don't ever give up on God because he won't give up on you. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Not even your kids, because I have great kids, great great kids. And sometimes you just keep praying for them. Okay? Anyway, just don't have a thing, Okay, babe? I love you. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going we're gonna to stand and pray, and I'm going to send y'all out of here. Let's stand. Except for Mother, she, she doesn't have to stand. You don't have to stand if you don't want to. So we're going to ask prayer for traveling mercies and for us to remember all that we heard and, uh, and, and understand what's taking place. One of the reasons why people don't actually want to engage in this kind of talk is because it opens up wide a bunch of stuff. And people don't like to go there. They just don't. So we're going to ask God to help us grow up in this area so we can care enough about people. Can you imagine the Son of God was omniscient? He was aware of all of this all the time. And he still came. 
Father, we, we thank you for tonight's introductory class. I thank you for all these sisters. We thank you for this time of uh, opening up and being honest and sincere and calling out for help. Um, we, we ask that you would do something for us. And that is meet our needs at our deepest, deepest self. Um, individually and in our families. Uh, and, and wherever we are struggling, we need your grace. And so we're calling upon you to help us. We humble ourselves before you as nothing, as weak, as feeble, as broken, as sinful and rebellious in the cause of our own problems. And so we acknowledge, oh Lord, we acknowledge our sinfulness before you. We acknowledge that we deserve what we get and we acknowledge your goodness to us in spite of us and your mercy to us in spite of us and your kindness to us in spite of us. And we acknowledge your power to heal, your power to restore, your power to fix everything that's going on in our life. And so we lay ourselves before you as your sons and daughters and needy men and women, asking that you bring to us whatever we need by way of counsel, by way of revelation, by way of epiphany, by way of just a mere change in our perspective, by way of providence. God, you are able to do all things. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. And as we go our way, give us traveling mercies and continue to soften our hearts towards you and towards one another. And teach us, oh God, what it means to walk with you in truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.